Aliens attack the Earth and millions die. What would you do if you woke up and found a huge dome surrounding your city and blocking any light from seeping through? Hello, welcome. Today I will show you a classic 1996 American science fiction action film called Independence Day, the film was written by Roland Emmerich and Dean Devlin and directed by Emmerich. Our film begins on July 2, 1996, the same day it was viewed for the first time. At the New Mexico Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute, one of the physicists discovers a pulsing signal from space over his radar. He decides to investigate and calls it in to the chief. The other scientists are baffled and when one of them suggests it could be life on another planet but they dismiss this as an impossibility. The government through the Secretary of Defense soon finds the cause of the problem a flying object 550 kilometers wide in diameter circling the Earth and slowly descending. It is currently at the outer orbit around the Earth, but its deceleration speed shows it would reach I view fast. The secretary calls United States President Thomas Whitmore and updates him of this event. David Levinson is an MIT-trained satellite technician working at a cable company in New York. His ex-wife, Constance Spano works as the White House Communications Director in Washington, D.C. That day, David's office is super busy as satellites are malfunctioning all over the world. When they are informed about the spaceship hovering them, David does not believe it since it would be impossible for a large object to enter the Earth due to the Earth's shape. Oh, you better believe it David. The mothership deploys saucer-shaped smaller ships 24 kilometers across and these hover major cities, including New York, Los Angeles, and Washington, D.C. At the Oval Office, the President meets with other generals so they can figure out a course of action. At a Marine military base in Iraq, some Marines see a large cloud that depicts the entry of the mothership and report it back to the U.S. government. The mothership has now reached eye view and it comes with smoke and clouds, typical apocalypse. People in the streets first take a few seconds to marvel at this historic moment before all hell breaks loose. Traffic is jammed and people are running in all directions trying to flee the darkness of the ship's shadow. There is a light earthquake and TVs all over the world are malfunctioning. While people in David's office flee, David takes his time and looks closely at the ship from the building's rooftop. He is able to decode a signal with hidden transmissions, it is that close. He talks to his co-workers believing that the code is some sort of signal used to coordinate an attack. He thinks that when the signal disappears, then the attack will be upon them. It has approximately six hours. He calls his wife and informs her of the threat but she accuses him of being paranoid and hangs up. The president has decided to give a press release to the citizens in light of the mystery. At the same time, Steve Hiller, a Marine F-A-18 pilot is at home sleeping with his girlfriend Jasmine when his girlfriend's son, Dylan barges in the room and tell them about the ship. They dismiss him and continue sleeping. When he finally wakes up, he realizes it's true when he sees the ship. He gets a call from his superior and is deployed for a mission despite being on vacation. Desperate time indeed. After the ship reaches, some TV channels are able to broadcast. One particular man, Russell a former fighter pilot and war veteran claims to have been abducted by aliens 10 years ago. He says the aliens interrogated him and experimented on him but he is termed hysteric. He decides to flee the city with his family. David gets his father and they head to DC to get his wife. At the gate to the White House, they find a bunch of Protestants. They call Constance who reluctantly lets them in and gets them a meeting with the president. They inform the president of the threat but he seems to pay no mind. Two Air Force planes are circling the plane and they get shot down with an advanced directed energy weapon exploding. This gets the president's attention and he orders all the major cities be evacuated and they leave in a jet. However it is too late and the six hour time mark is up and the destroyers shoot bombs at the cities causing massive explosions and wipe out any life on the city. Jasmine and Dylan take cover in an underground tunnel and emerge when the destruction is done. The streets are bare and barren. On the 3rd of July, the defense forces launch counterattacks on the ship using a squadron of marines called Black Knights and Captain Hiller is among those dispatched. 
However, the fighter jet's weapons fail to penetrate the smaller ships as they have a protective field force. The destroyer releases smaller attacker ships that begin attacking the jets. Their weapons are far more advanced than the army's weapons, and they are greatly destroyed. The command recalls all jets back. Captain Hiller manages to lead one of the ships astray, but the extra distance causes his jet to lose fuel. He realizes that he would lose the alien, so he directs his jet to crash against the alien ship and ejects himself using a parachute. He safely lands in the desert and walks towards the wreckage when he finds the alien. Angry, he punches it unconscious and drags it using his parachute across the desert. He sees many vehicles belonging to the people who managed to escape the destruction. He finds Russell and asks for his help and Russell agrees. In the jet, the president and his console are discussing the best ways to move forward and address the situation. David's father interjects saying that the government knew about the attack but decided to blindly ignore it. He says that a couple years ago, the government had taken ownership of some alien ships. Whitmore quickly shrugs this off saying Area 51 is just a myth, but the secretary, Albert reveals that the US has been involved with the UFO conspiracies since 1947. They reach the location of Area 51 and are welcomed by Dr. Oaken who is a scientist. He shows them bodies of the aliens that had landed with the first ship and the said ship already refurbished and ready for launch. At the same time, Hiller reaches the camp and the military and other scientists rush to see the alien. They take it into the lab but in the process of extracting its protective shield, awaken it. It penetrates Oaken's mind after killing the rest of the workers and speaks to Whitmore overlooking through the glass window. It demands to be released and says no peace will come to the humans. It also telepathically links its mind with the president's so it can try to escape but the secret service and other military men shoot it dead. Dr. Oaken falls into a coma. Whitmore recovers and says while the alien had interconnected them, he was able to learn their intentions, they plan on completely ruining the earth and using its resources for themselves. The team thinks that they can launch a nuclear weapon powerful enough to destroy the field force. Whitmore reluctantly agrees, and they launch the weapon. It explodes, but does not penetrate the force further disappointing the people. Back in Los Angeles, Jasmine and Dylan get a truck and move around the city looking and picking up survivors. They encounter the US First Lady, Marilyn Whitmore, who is injured. They contact Hiller, who comes and rescues them taking them back to Area 51. Whitmore reunites with his wife, but the doctor informs him that she has sustained fatal internal bleeding and injuries. Whitmore encourages her saying she would be okay, but passes on later. On the 4th of July, David calls the team to the room with the operable spaceship. He shows them how the shield works, it is a computer program complete with an operating system. David has devised a computer malware slash virus that would attack the field's OS causing it to fail and removing the protective shield using the spaceship. It is to be launched at the mothership as the OS is in there and it will fully disintegrate the field force. Hiller takes it upon himself and volunteers to drive the ship. David offers to go with him as he is quite familiar with the computer program. Whitmore communicates to other nations through Morse code. He urges them to release their spare squadrons with fighter jets so they can coordinate an attack against the destroyers and aliens. At this point, the mothership can be seen clearly from all points in the world and the news of attacks has left all people worried. The hope is that the virus works because how else do you defend yourself from an undefeatable enemy? After the previous attack to the squadrons, there is a limited number of pilots as there are jets. The president calls in for volunteer pilots who understand that this could well be a one-way mission, patriots ready to die in the hope of saving the world. Russell is among the volunteers as he thinks it is partly his fault that this happened. The president, a former pilot and war veteran also volunteers and takes command of the jets. The ultimate sacrifice. Before the war begins, a little moment of happiness is witnessed. Hiller and Jasmine decide to get married. Dylan acts as the ring bearer, while David and Constance are witnesses. The simple wedding creates such feelings of affection that the two exes have a moment and hold hands. Truly, disaster can soften even the hardest of hearts. It is now time to create a new meaning to Independence Day. 
Hopefully, it is the day that the whole world is liberated from the alien invasion. Worse, it could be the day that all life on Earth is terminated. Either way, the preparing squadrons are hoping for the best but have prepared for the worse. The people on the other hand are in paradoxical moods. There is hope that they live to see the 5th of July, and worry that this might be their last day on Earth. Why do you ask? Because the aliens are now planning a fully pledged attack on Earth. It is the last attack on Earth, the one to completely destroy the world as we know it. Hiller and David enter the mothership as they have an alien ship so they reach the center with ease. They insert the virus and the communication systems of the aliens and protective shields are destroyed. They also deploy a nuclear missile but the ship is caught on a clamp. Knowing this is the end, they start smoking some cigars they had brought for the journey and thank each other for a job well done. Relax, we ain't done yet. On the ground, Whitmore commandeers an attack on the destroyer ship bearing down on the base. They attack it and it retaliates. A war has begun and many people are killed. His squadron can now combat the alien fighters, but they run out of ammo before they can fully destroy the ship. The aliens decide to launch their weapon on the base. Russell has a missile but cannot launch it due to the jet's launcher malfunction. He sacrifices himself by crashing his jet into the destroyer's weapon destroying the ship. Whitmore communicates with other military forces around the world about the ship's weaknesses and they start destroying the destroyers. Irony much. The force of these attacks reaches the mother ship causing Hiller's ship to be released from the clamp holding it. The ship manages to escape through the closing entryway. Immediately they escape, the nuclear missile detonates, destroying the mother ship. People from across the world watch as it burns and applauds the team responsible for giving them hope. The film ends as Hiller and David enjoy one of their victory cigars and they reunite with their families at Area 51. That was our time, thank you for watching. Remember to like, share, and subscribe.